Hello and welcome to Tiny Tides Storytime. My name is Elizabeth and today we will be reading Life in the Ocean, the story of oceanographer Sylvia Earle, written and illustrated by Claire A. Nivola. Seen from above, Earth's land seems to float like islands on a vast sea. There is so much more blue than green. Hidden below the surface of that ocean lies an immense watery world. Catching the sun's light at first, then cold and utterly black in its depths, the sea covers mountains taller, plains broader, and valleys steeper than any here on land. Life came from the ocean long ago, and without the ocean none of us, neither you nor I, could survive a day. Living organisms in the sea release the oxygen we breathe in and take up the carbon dioxide we breathe out. Along with the plants on land, the ocean forms the lungs of our planet, breathing in and out. Its surface evaporates to form the marvelous clouds that give us rain and snow. Its temperature shapes the weather patterns we live by, and it is home to more life forms and surprising creatures, from its shallows to its deepest depths, than we have here on land. Sylvia Earle, who has spent more than 7,000 hours underwater, calls the ocean the blue heart of the planet. Sylvia began her early childhood inland on an old farm just outside Paulsboro, New Jersey. Her mother and father bought the place when Sylvia was three years old so that she and her two brothers could grow up in the country just as their parents had done. Even when she was very small, Sylvia spent hours outdoors exploring on her own. She was far too curious to be afraid. There were so many living creatures in every inch of the nearby woods, in the farmer's pond, in its creek, and among the gnarled trees and grapevines of its orchard that she never felt alone. Sylvia's parents planted apple, pear, and walnut trees in a large vegetable garden. Countless butterflies visited the flowers of the garden, and the fragrance of the lilac bushes in May made one's head spin. Little Sylvia would sit by herself, very still and for a very long time, waiting and watching to see what was going on in the pond or under a fallen tree in the woods. Her mother called these outings investigations. In a notebook, Sylvia described what she saw. The windowsills of the house were lined with her collection jars, which held tadpoles, salamanders, insects, and plants. Sylvia said she was a biologist and a botanist long before she even knew what those words meant. When Sylvia was 12, her family moved to Florida. Gone would be the pond teeming with life in summer and glazed with ice for skating in winter. Gone her beloved pony and quarter horse, the orchard, creek, and woods, how hard it was to leave. And yet Sylvia could not possibly have imagined what awaited her as they drove up the dead-end street to their new home north of Clearwater. There, before her, lay the vast, broad sea. In New Jersey, she had visited the Atlantic Ocean, but this water was a clear blue-green, and it was warm and calm, the Gulf of Mexico right in her own backyard. It was then, her mother said, that Sylvia lost her heart to the water. That birthday, Sylvia was given a pair of swim goggles. Floating on the surface of the grassy water, she began her investigations all over again, finding tiny crabs, darting fish, and the occasional seahorse that reminded her of the horse and pony she had left behind. Meeting all these new creatures, she said, softened the blow of leaving the farm. How could she feel lonely when every spoonful of water was filled with life? In the library, she found books by the naturalist William Beebe describing his descent into the deep ocean in his bathysphere some 30 years earlier. Sylvia wanted to see what he had seen with her own eyes, and as she grew up, it seemed that nothing was going to stop her. When Sylvia was only five, she had climbed unafraid into a single passenger seat behind the pilot of a small plane and flown up and over the field where her parents watched, amazed. From the age of 16, when she swam 30 feet to the bottom of a river using diving gear for the first time, to scuba diving while researching algae for her university degree, to joining an expedition where she was the only woman among 70 men on a research ship in the Indian Ocean, to leading a team of divers stationed for two weeks in a deep-sea laboratory off the U.S. Virgin Islands, to walking on the ocean floor in an aqua suit that looked like a spacesuit, to descending 3,000 feet in the Pacific Ocean in a one-person spherical bubble she had helped to design, to plunging 13,000 feet underwater in a Japanese submersible, Sylvia never stopped trying to dive deeper and see more. A 
Again and again, she has emerged from her dives to tell us what she has seen. She describes creatures who do not fear her, but rather look at her with the same curiosity she has for them. Take the humpback whale, 40 feet long and weighing 80,000 pounds, who, on the first day of a three-month whale study, swam straight to her like a freight train bearing down on a mouse. Moments before the collision, the whale swerved gracefully, tilting her great head to look into Sylvia's eyes with her own grapefruit-sized eyes as she slid past inches away at high speed. By the second day, the whales were waiting for the boat. As Sylvia dove into the water, their dark shapes instantly swam swiftly toward her from below. From the start, Sylvia said, I found myself being observed by them. Pictures of whales, says Sylvia, make them look big and fat and ponderous and lumpy. Whales are like swallows, like otters. They move in any direction. They swim upside down. They're vertical. They're every which way. They are sleek and elegant and gorgeous, among the most exquisite creatures on the planet. They move like ballerinas, rollicking, frolicking creatures, doing all this wonderful dancing in the sea. Sylvia has even heard whales singing while she's been underwater. And once, the force of the sound waves made her entire body vibrate and shake. Wavelengths of light do not penetrate deep into water, but sound waves travel four times faster in water than in air, so whales can communicate across vast distances. Sylvia says that hearing their haunting and beautiful songs in the sea is like being inside the heart of an orchestra. So much of diving is an all too brief glimpse below the surface. Sylvia had always wanted to know what it was like to live in the sea, to be a part of the daily life of the underwater world. She finally had a chance to do just that when she spent two weeks 50 feet below at the deep sea station Tektite 2. For as many as 12 hours a day, she swam among the fish and coral reefs, watching the changeover from day to night and back again. Using a small flashlight at night, she noticed that the day fish tucked in to the same nooks and crevices the night fish had just vacated. Each fish often returning time and again to its same resting place, just as we do. Among others, Sylvia came to know the five gray angel fish she saw each day. One shy, one more aggressive, some, like her, full of curiosity. She observed the whole cast of characters, squirrelfish, triggerfish, parrotfish, that came and went in the course of a day and night. The way you get to know a neighborhood if you keep your eyes and ears and heart open. Just as no two people are alike, no two creatures of the sea are alike. And yet we all have so much in common. Think of eating and digestion. Sylvia reminds us. Lobsters do it. Horseshoe crabs do it. Sharks do it. We do it. Of that time, she has said, I'm changed forever because I lived underwater for two weeks in 1970. I wish that everybody could go live underwater, if only for a day. Sylvia was just as eager to travel as far down as possible into the deepest ocean. The walk she took in the gym suit nine years after her stay among the coral reefs was on the ocean floor off Hawaii, 1,250 feet down, deeper than anyone has ever walked. She had imagined, as we might too, that it would be black darkness down there. If she had gone another 1,600 feet down, it would have been. But here, to her delight, the midday sun still sifted its blue light waves through the clear ocean water, and she found herself in a magical twilight of deep indigo. There weren't stars visible, but there were bioluminescent creatures flashing with their blue fire. From the ocean floor sprang a field of bamboo coral, some socks taller than she was. When she touched the top of the long, pale spirals, little blue donuts of light pulsed down them. When she touched them at the bottom, the same pulses moved upward, ring after ring of light. Every spoonful of water in the deep ocean, Sylvia says, is brimming with extraordinary forms of life. Creatures, each in their own way, sparkle and flash with lights of their own, like fireflies here on land. One expedition 3,000 feet down was, Sylvia says, like diving into a galaxy. We have explored only 5% of the ocean. We know more about the planets in outer space than we know about the sea on our very own home planet. Sylvia Earle believes that if we do not learn about the ocean world, we will never really care about it or take care of it. 
When you next look out over the ocean, stop to think of the vast mountains, valleys, and plains below its surface. Think of how it breathes and gives us life. And think of all the wondrous creatures it holds in its waters, from whales to busy, colorful coral reefs, to those living firework displays that light up the cold, black waters of its mysterious depths. Thank you for joining us on today's Tiny Tides Storytime. If you enjoyed our video, please give it a like. And if you wish to continue getting more of our videos, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow us on Facebook at the Puget Sound Estuarium.